There we go. And with that, I'd like to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Susan. Great. Thank you, Ron. Well, Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Dr. Andrew Farnsworth with us this evening. Andrew began birding at age five and quickly developed his long-standing fascinations with bird migration simply by watching birds move from one place to another. It was in 1998 when Andrew heard Dr. Sidney Gothrow speak about the power and potential of radar ornithology that Andrew knew what his future would be to study bird migration at scales of space and time that in 1998 were only imaginable, but today realized. Dr. Farnsworth received his undergraduate degree in natural resources at Cornell, his master's in zoology at Clemson, and his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University. Today, Dr. Farnsworth is senior research associate in the Center for Avian Population Studies at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Tonight, Dr. Farnsworth will be speaking about his current research efforts to advance the use and application of rapidly expanding technologies to study bird movements across scales, including weather surveillance radar, audio and video recording and monitoring tools, community science data sets, and machine learning techniques. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Andrew Farnsworth as he takes us on an informative journey. It's great to uh, see you all, at least in uh, name in the attendees list and uh, to know that you're out there. Um, I wanna thank everybody that is out there for joining tonight. Um, I wish I could be there in person. I hope to at some point in the future. So yeah, um, Susan, thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight again. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about something that I've, I've uh, had the great fortune to do, uh, spend my time doing over the last 20 years, um, sort of officially, and uh, maybe almost the last 40 years unofficially. Um, thinking about migration, studying migration, and now being able to, to talk about it in ways and study it in ways that were just not possible when I first started thinking about it. So BirdCast, um, hopefully many of you know a little bit about BirdCast um, and, and have visited the website birdcast.info. Just a tiny bit of background um, on the project and kind of where it came from. As birders, uh, you all um, must think about, hopefully, or after this talk you will, think about migration and have some thoughts about, oh, I, I think I know how to forecast and predict what I might see on a given day when I go out birding, or when would I go to a certain place to experience something? Oh, okay, I know that. I can figure that information out. Um, we thought it would be really cool to think, okay, well, maybe we can actually really model that and, and create some some quantitative ways of doing it so that that we could have machines do it. Um, yeah, wonderful to have people and humans do it all for that. But to think about ways to study it with machines was really sort of intriguing to us. And in particular, it was intriguing about 10 years ago, because we had this opportunity to partner with computer scientists who were really interested in uh, messy data and making predictions from things that were not necessarily easy uh, to, to understand. Um, and, and along come the ornithologists and the biologists and say, oh, we have messy data. We have things that, yeah, as humans, we might be able to understand well, but maybe we don't know all the mathematical modeling. Maybe we can't necessarily simplify it into some kind of general system. Um, but yeah, we'd love to try. And that was the genesis of, of the current version of BirdCast, this intersection of computer science and biology. And it was funded by National Science Foundation. And it rested actually on a project that was about 10 years older that started, that was a, a really like at the sort of the dawn of the internet age when you know your 2400 baud modem maybe allowed you to download images like in 10 or 15 minutes <laughs> perhaps. Um, but that was the real genesis of BirdCast was 1998, 1999. And there was a project that had this very image uh, by Charlie Harper, The Mystery of the Missing Migrants, one of my favorite illustrations of all time, um, on the website that was a collaboration between radar ornithologists at Clemson University, where I was at the time, where Sid Gotro was teaching, um, Cornell, 
uh, that was actually doing acoustic work and the very earliest versions of citizen and now what's called community science. Um, the, the evolution of eBird, it was called bird source at that point. Um, and uh, the uh, Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, uh, National Audubon, and a company called Geo Marine. And there was this partnership that was all about thinking at that time, so 20, 20 plus years ago, um, oh, could we, could we build some of these forecasts and post it online and have people go ground truth and go bird in the morning? And it was so far ahead of its time. It, like, it, it was cool, but it was not even half as cool as some of the stuff that the team I work with now can do. So with all that said, let me get into it a little bit, okay? I probably don't need to frame this for you guys, but uh, one of the primary reasons that I do what I do now, aside from a love of birds, is all about thinking about how can we put birds back into the system in the US and in North America alone. We know, I'm sure you've all seen, talking about tremendous population losses over the last 50 years, um, in particular in uh, birds that are migratory. So um, thinking about trying to explain why those trends happened, what's going on to cause them, and then obviously, how can we reverse some of those things? That's a big part of, of um, the reason for why I do what I do, and certainly what's behind what's happening at the Lab of Ornithology. And one of the ways I'd like to, to frame uh, what we do, just kind of from the biggest picture I can think of and coming down a little bit further, is thinking about, it, even at this point, this is 10 years old, uh, the global footprint of humanity, right? And where, where, where humans are, where their infrastructure is, um, where the impacts that we impose on the environment are. And it's not evenly distributed, but it is extensively distributed. And it is certainly global in nature. And in thinking about that, Yes, there's a way to directly connect what that previous slide showed of uh, population declines, dramatic declines over the last 50 years, and where humans are and what humans are doing. But there's also a side to this that obviously leads us out of that, hopefully back into the repopulation or stabilization or maintenance of, of species and biodiversity, populations and biodiversity. And that is also where humans are. And it's thinking about, for example, com the community science, the, the where eBirders are, where people are reporting observations. So we understand where and when and how many birds are occurring at different places on the planet. Hopefully some of you have seen this graphic before, but for those of you that haven't, there are no political boundaries drawn on here um, at all. This is all just each individual point representing an observation in the eBird database. And this is, this is not really current. This slide actually is probably a year and a half old, so it probably fills in more. But this is kind of the flip side of thinking about, well, all the places where humans do and quote sort of bad things or impactful things that are negative. Um, let's flip it and think about it the other way about where we can go and collect information and understand where and where birds are and how they're using their environments and, and, and build up a knowledge base from there. So thinking about this is, is the framework where I start to think about knowledge and kind of growing our, our understanding of, of what's happening with bird populations and species around the globe. And obviously that really dense yellow area in the United States in particular is a lot of people, a lot of observations happening and a lot of information that we can make sense of. But one of the things I, I also like, uh, the caveat I like to bring up here is that most of the observations that are here are made during the day, they're diurnal. So yeah, they tell us a tremendous amount about where birds are during the day and what they're doing and what habitats and numbers. And yeah, hopefully you don't put an X in there. Hopefully you put a number in, but nonetheless, it's information about what's happening during the day. So we know from thinking about migration that there's a lot more to the story than that. So eBird tells us part of the story about where birds are when in the annual cycle, but there's more information that we want there. And there are a couple of ways we can get at it. And what I'll be focusing on today is this other less direct way of, of sampling and understanding bird movements and where bird populations are. Remote sensing, if you will, um, using technology basically to be in the places or see the things that we can or, or extend our sensory capabilities beyond just where a 
human is at any given time on the planet. And this graphic just shows where the radar infrastructure around the world is. So the areas where all that white is, that's coverage by a weather surveillance radar. So you can see there's, there's a pretty significant distribution of where that human infrastructure is that covers um, uh, the locations where we have radar. Obviously, there are some big parts of the world that are missing it, but in the places where it occurs, thinking about using it to survey the atmosphere, to study it in all the ways we can using all its potential uh, characteristics, there's a pretty powerful opportunity there. So getting into thinking about weather surveillance radar, and this is kind of at the core of what BirdCast really has been has been about, certainly from the front facing side, those of you who have visited the website and those of you who probably heard about BirdCast, think about probably, oh yeah, it's a project that, that uses radar to, to track bird migration or to study bird migration. Yeah, it's one of many pieces, but that is the front facing piece. And let me frame up for you what we're talking about here when, when BirdCast uh, is, is thinking about how we sample the contiguous US, for example. Radars are, are Ubiquitous, sure. There are 143 of them in the contiguous US. Uh, they're not everywhere, but they are quite significantly uh, numerous that we can really study the airspace above uh, the continent very well. And I, I want you to think about this again. I mentioned the perspective of indirect sampling, right, of remote sensing, of using, using technology that goes beyond uh, what a human can sense to gather information. So keep that in mind, these 143 radars and this incredible network that's across the United States. And, and let, me, let me continue to, to frame the story a little bit further. And let's think about that continental network in the perspective of, oh, there, there actually was another approach to monitoring bird migration. Uh, at night um, that predated that network by a good 50 years. Um, and that was this incredible, incredible study that George Lowry and Robert Newman and a number of their colleagues uh, began in the early 1950s, uh, in particular, um, four nights uh, in October, where they gathered together their friends um, to watch the moon and to train a telescope on the face of the full moon, wherever people were observing, and count the number of birds, and then do some trigonometry and some calculation and figure out like, oh, okay, well, now we actually have direct visual study by having people survey all around the, the continental US where we can get them, um, how many birds are flying past the face of the moon, we can generate a migration traffic rate, we can put together the first continental migration monitoring map of what's happening at night over the United States. Yeah, it's got pieces, it's scattered, it's not evenly distributed, but it's a snapshot of what was happening on those four nights. Now, that happened, those four nights were in the early 50s. The paper was published in 1966. It took all that time, most of it, to analyze those data, to process those data. It was an, an enormous undertaking to characterize what happened over four nights. And it was, this, it was a breakthrough um, uh, of this wonderful moment. And thinking about this and all the effort, all the human effort that went into this first survey, this first series of them, um, and then returning to where we are now with the continental network of radars that we have. I just think that frames very well the power of technology to not replace the human, but to just do things that, that we, we can't do on scales that, that are just really difficult to process and difficult to imagine. So thinking even about what these radars detect. So th this image from May 15, uh, a few years ago, you see a lot of things here. Um, there's a lot happening. And, and these, these radars, uh, just to, to be clear, WSR-88D is their official name, Weather Surveillance Radar 1988D for Doppler. Um, this is the second generation weather surveillance radar network um, in the United States, the first being in the 50s. This upgrade that happened in the late 80s and was really deployed through the 90s, and we still use it today. Um, the, uh, the, the capacity to, to not only survey the atmosphere and the magnitude of what was up there, but the Doppler component, being able to understand what direction 
whatever targets radar was was uh, uh, capturing and, and sampling, what direction are those things moving and at what speed relative to the radar, that was a real breakthrough. And so the, the, the basic concept here is that those 143 radars are sending out a pulse of microwave energy. They have an antenna that's angled at about half a degree all the way up to 19 and a half degrees. So as that pulse of microwave energy goes away from the radar, it leaves the surface of the earth, it rises, right? And when it interacts with something in the atmosphere, whether it be rain or bats or birds or insects or pollen or smoke, whatever it is, some of that microwave energy will be scattered back to the radar. Um, and we can assess the magnitude of that, as I mentioned, the direction and speed of the movement, the altitude because of knowing where the beam is. So the potential to, to survey the atmosphere is enormous. And as I said, these radars are, are capturing all sorts of information. Yes, they were designed for meteorological purposes. But frankly speaking, they actually uh, probably do a better job of sampling the biology that's up there because there's often more of it than the meteorology. And just to kind of highlight that, what's happening in this image um, to, to orient you to it, you'll notice there are many places where there are very bright reds and yellows and kind of blocky irregular patterns that you might see um, in the middle, in the center of the country, uh, in the, the southern eastern Great Plains, up into the Great Lakes, part of the Florida Peninsula. That's precipitation. It's kind of the boundary between warm and cold air masses where there's interaction and turbulence and storms and convection and precipitation is falling. Um, and the radar does a great job of telling us where that is. Now, the other patterns that you see, those uniform blues and greens, the sort of more annular patterns, if you will, um, that's biology. That's dominated in this case by birds. And so when you think about, well, what if we could take away that meteorology and leave only the biology behind, this could be a super powerful means to basically do at a much greater scale and, and uh, with much greater computational efficiency, that same kind of study that happened in the 50s. Um, so this was at the core of what we wanted to do with BirdCast, be able to automate this process of taking away the meteorology, take the remaining biology that's dominated by birds, figure out the ways to characterize and quantify that and to turn it into information that we could analyze. And now we're able to make that happen. So we can take those kinds of maps. We can create some really beautiful visualizations that basically remove the meteorology and then do some interpolation from obviously the there are, as I mentioned, there are radars all over the United States in terms of their coverage. Um, but being able to take that information that's dominated by birds and, and frame it to you and present it to you in a way that takes away from that meteorology for the moment so you can understand, oh, where is there really intense migration happening? Um, and, and in this case, what direction is it moving? The arrows represent the directions birds are going. And those really intense colors are more intense migration. So we could characterize those things now that we have that capability to, to learn um, from the computer scientists, learn the ways how to process these data, uh, extract the meteorology from the biology, and produce from that kind of graphic you saw with everything, this kind of much more specific approach to looking at, well, what is the observed migration on this night from 28 uh, September 2020? And where was it most intense? What direction was it moving? So very powerful kind of uh, moment for us to be able to see this. This, this uh, kind of graphic, as I intimated, really took about 20 years to go from the start where that previous slide kind of indicated was to where we are here. So uh, quite an amazing growth for us. Now, we could go farther. Once we could do that with one night, one scan, one, one image, one, one data point um, from, from all of those 143 radars, well, we could start looking at that over time. We could look at all the radar data that were archived freely available to the public because it's a federally funded project. Um, we could dig back into the archive of radar data and start thinking like, well, all right, let's, let's quantitate how many birds are passing on a given year or are moving through the United States. 
And this was a real eye opener to us. Uh, maybe some of you have, have sort of had that hyperbolic feeling of thinking like, oh, there are tens of millions or hundreds of millions, or maybe there are billions of birds, you know, up until maybe uh, four or five years ago, I think many people that study migration, in particular in the United States, often would throw around these numbers figuring, yeah, we're probably close to right, it's hundreds of millions to, to billions, but it was just sort of a lot of hand waving. Um, the, the first approaches using some of these quantitative methods now from the, the red ornithological perspective allowed us to put some numbers on those to really start to understand wow, every spring where the green arrows are in this figure, we're talking about approximately two and a half to three and a half billion birds migrating through the US over the US uh, every spring. And then in the fall, those orange arrows that yeah, birds are of course productive after the breeding season um, and, and there are more birds returning than there were coming, uh, four to five billion on the return. Just having this kind of, a, of, a, of an understanding illuminated a, great range of sort of questions, concepts, possibilities for us, and really seem to capture a lot of people's attention. So this, this plan to kind of quantify and to think about it from the scale of, yes, we can do it for a single night, or we can look at it for a year or over many years for that matter. There's a lot of power there. And we realized, all right, we can do more than just quantify here and talk about trends, some of which I'll come to back to later in the talk, we can actually start to think about taking those data and then making predictions based on them. So if we have what happened with bird migration, if we can characterize it and we can look at images over many, many years, well, we ought to be able to take different kinds of predictors and then say, well, can we predict migration? How, how good of a model can we build? And it turns out we could do a pretty good job with one. So taking those radar training data, um, again, thinking about extracting the meteorology and talking about the, the biology dominated by birds and building up a data set where you can, can characterize that over lots of different images and start to learn associations between when those patterns of migration are occurring and when different weather variables are occurring, that leads you into the migration forecast model. So this is work that, or this is a, a cartoon that, that actually sort of embodies the work that was done by a current postdoc and, and former Cornell undergraduate, former Oxford graduate student, Benjamin Van Doren, um, and Kyle Horton, who's a professor at uh, Colorado State. They published on this in uh, 2018 in Science, and it was a continental system for forecasting bird migration. And at the core of it, those, those weather variables, that information that in the weather forecast, we could learn to make the migration forecast, there were some very simple patterns that arose. And this, this study looked at uh, 23 years of data and the, this was uh, all spring-based um, spring uh, information. And so uh, some of the things that were immediately clear were that, oh, air temperature is actually a, the most important predictor of whether there's going to be migration um, of all of the variables we looked at. And air temperature is obviously easy to forecast. So thinking about getting that information and, and building a model from it, oh, that works very well. Obviously, uh, so too date was very important, which we all know that yes, there's a seasonality to migration and there is a peak period when it occurs. Uh, so too the altitude where you are, the lower you are, the closer to sea level, uh, the more migration occurs and so on. But, but these kinds of key patterns, this uh, study elucidated all of them and looked at it at a scale that previously was just uh, not possible for us to imagine. I mean, it was an enormous quantity of data. And if so far uh, into the future from that 1950s approach of thinking about direct visual confirmation of migration by watching the moon. But take home here, very important, I want you to remember, air temperature, the most uh, important predictor of whether there's going to be migration in the spring. So with that, we could start to make these kinds of forecast models, right? And this is just one that we, this is a GIF that an animated uh, um, uh, 
uh, image that we had put up on the website, uh, even though it's a fall image, it just captures kind of the magnitude of the movement that we're talking about. So these forecasts, um, it's wonderful to be able to, to show them at the continental scale. And obviously when you think about different regions of, of the contiguous US, you certainly associate that different things are happening in different places. In the Pacific versus the Mountain West, there's a difference. Obviously an order of magnitude difference of what's happening in the West and what's happening in the center of the country in terms of the numbers of migrants that are passing and that we can forecast. So just this concept of thinking about, about taking uh, all of these radar data, building these models, relating those patterns to weather information that we can easily forecast to build a migration forecast model, and then operationalize it so that we could post this information every six hours on the BirdCast website. That was super cool to us and a really watershed moment that what happened also a few years ago, around the same time that that characterization of how many birds are, are moving through the US, what's the biomass flow happening? Both of these things occurred around the same time. And of course, once you have the forecast, you could then take a look and think about, well, how does it compare to actually what happened? And in this case, um, the model did quite well in terms of the distribution of where that intense flight is and where the observations of that intense flight is. So we could start to, to really think about looking at these different patterns and feel quite good. Yeah, the, the statistics on the model are such that it's the, um, uh, it explains about regularly 80% of the variation in bird migration intensity using weather variables. So it does a good job of capturing, you know, where and when and how many birds are migrating. It's not perfect but it does a great job and it's consistent across years. We, we tested it. It's nice though to see it visually and to understand these kinds of patterns or understand the models from the perspective of are they producing something that we think is meaningful and then being able to investigate it. So uh, this has been a um, uh, really a, an opportunity to kind of think about this monitoring network and how we can use the characterization of radar data to study bird migration and then turn it into all sorts of quantitative and predictive and and just really fun and cool and important facts right so that's wonderful and we love the science for the sake of the science but um certainly from my own personal perspective absolutely from the mission of the cornell lab of ornithology and certainly from many many of our collaborators and our partners and our audience members we want to do a little more with that we want to be able to take the science just for its understanding its value and turn it into some positive uh, in particular conservation action so let me shift gears a little bit and and talk about that so keep in mind all that information about nocturnal migration that you could understand from radar and the ways you could measure it and, and quantify it and so on over time. And then I want you to think about nocturnal migrants from the perspective of what they need to navigate around what they need to orient. Um, what kind of challenges do they face, not just from when they stop over on the ground necessarily, but also when they're traveling at night. And, and I'll frame it particularly from the perspective of collisions. And maybe some of you have seen these kinds of numbers before, but the numbers of birds colliding with structures, buildings and residences in particular, is enormous. The annual mortality it's, there's a range, the middle of that range is around 600 million birds, but it spans about 380 million to almost a billion birds every year in the US killed in collisions with structures. A lot of those with windows, a lot of buildings with, with windows, and a lot of them with light and related to light pollution. And this notion of thinking about these dangerous skies and then the information that we could potentially gather to inform, well, how might we address this kinds of hazards from the radar data using that information? It's a great opportunity, a great synergistic moment to think about applying the radar ornithological methods and the information to actually potentially maybe do something that, that, that really could make a difference. Um, I don't, I never liked showing, you know, slides of, uh, of mortality and the, the sort of the embodiment of what happens when birds collide, but it's a reality of where we are uh, right at the moment. These images um, 
there are some that are relatively current. On the far left, that was from September of this past year, uh, below the World Trade Center building complexes in southern Manhattan. Um, a friend and colleague, Melissa Breyer, captured these images and collected uh, several hundred, uh, mostly uh, paroled warblers, uh, beneath those buildings on the night of uh, September 13, September 14. Um, uh, major events have occurred at other times. This is a, another, uh, the bottom two images are from Galveston, Texas um, in the spring of 2017, uh, 400 birds killed at the American National Insurance Building. Um, and this is not new though. Um, there have been birds attracted to light sources for that we know for, for really hundreds of years. Uh, obviously the, um, electrical age since the late 19th century is sort of embodied by that um, that image of the world's first world's fair in Chicago that was electrified um, the uh, powered by Tesla uh, going back even farther than the electrical age to oil burning lighthouses birds were attracted to those and there was quite tremendous mortality at those so the notion of light and birds colliding with things is is not terribly new um, in the sense of our human understanding. It is extremely new from the perspective of the evolution of birds and the evolution of migration. You think about those systems evolving over thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And then you put in the electrical or the oil burning age in this last tiny fraction of a percent of time, there's some new evolutionary stimulus that's happening there. So thinking about how can we protect birds from those kinds of uh, that, that powerful stimulus of light in particular um, and and how can we adjust our behaviors? That's where we're headed with this, with this kind of information and applying the conservation action. So one of the ways that we were very fortunate to, to start thinking about, uh, well, how can we bring to bear um, our, our capabilities to study migration and actually understand a little bit more about what the effects of light are? So then we can figure out how to address those. So this, uh, uh, you're seeing a couple of things here, uh, and let me try to orient you to them. So in the video that's playing, which is a, a, a loop, this is uh, imagery captured from the Tribute and Light in uh, Southern Manhattan, the National 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum tribute that's been happening um, every September since 2002, every September 11th, um, 88 very powerful lights turned uh, skyward, representing the fallen twin towers that were there lost in the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. And this is a memorial to the lives lost, the human lives lost on that night. And it's visible for probably more than 100 kilometers away from New York City. We don't exactly know how far. And, it, and certainly the light extends it far greater than 10 kilometers above the ground. And what you're seeing in the beams, even though it perhaps looks like moths or insects uh, sort of drifting with the wind, those are all birds. Um, and in fact, it's mostly dominated by four species of, uh, of warblers, ovenbird, black and white warbler, northern parilla, and American redstart. American redstart, actually, the, by far the dominant species here uh, in, the, in this uh, particular night in 2015. Um, and this this incredible memorial that obviously had nothing at all to do with birds, somber, um, powerful, enraging, uh, sad, all these kinds of powerful emotions, the artistic contribution to memorializing the lives lost, it had impacts in other ways in the city. Yes, we're talking about birds. There were others as well. And in New York, um, there was a unique opportunity that came along and it evolved over probably five or 10 years between the producers of this event, the organizers, the, the, the people that had developed it, the artists, the Municipal Arts Society, uh, the museum, once it actually uh, came to exist, politicians locally and conservationists and interested parties to say, well, look, you know, these kinds of situations, nobody wants to see any more death at this site. And after about five to 10 years of kind of consensus building, for lack of a better word, there was a decision and a choice made that, well, 
if a large number of birds greater than a thousand at a time get attracted to the beams we're going to shut the beams off um, we're going to request that they be turned down um, to the point that they're they're off over over a 20 minute period and then that they can come back on and that was not based on anything other than what seemed like some kind of reasonable science that if you turn the lights off maybe the birds will disperse while we were doing this shutdown procedure that was based really on good faith on all the parties involved, we used that opportunity to take radar samples, do some acoustic monitoring and some direct visual samples to understand, well, how are birds behaving across these periods? And that's what you see on the, on the right-hand side of this image. The, those graphics, the green represents areas when the or times when the lights are on at the tribute and light. The gray bars represent times when the lights are off. And even though you can't really see the numbers necessarily, it is a striking pattern, a striking periodicity that you can see between green and gray periods. And just to quickly orient you to what's happening there, that top bar, it's called migration activity, that's sampled from radar. And what you see is every time the lights are on, there's a tremendous increase in the number of birds that are in the beam that the radar is sampling. When you turn the lights off, those numbers decline dramatically. That middle bar there that says radial velocity. So that's one way that we were able to, again, apply the radar to sample, well, how, how are birds moving? How quickly are they moving through the beams? And when the lights are on, those velocities go down. Birds are circling around the beams. They're not making forward progress. There's a lot of a lot of slowing down and and not really directional flying per se. When the lights go off, the speeds all increase. Birds start flying directionally again. They move out of the beams. And in conjunction with those two radar perspectives of what birds, what bird behaviors were at the tribute and light, we also looked at acoustic behaviors. And interestingly, we saw a similar kind of periodicity when the lights are on, the call counts, the flight calls, these special vocalizations that birds are using at night to communicate, the call counts and the numbers go way up when the lights are on. As soon as the lights are off, the calls actually drop in some cases to zero. And these patterns all kind of align to tell us, well, light, this, these powerful lights have a very strong effect on attracting birds changing their migration behaviors, their migratory behaviors, and then also changing their communication behaviors. And when we turn the lights off, the birds return to a much more normal kind of a state. So this was one of the, for th this study was published in 2017. And um, it was kind of the eye opener for us that said, oh, we have some capability here, maybe to, to talk about something powerful, to take that science and think about, well, now we can characterize what does it mean when you shut the lights off, shut these bright exterior installation kinds of lights off? Well, now we know. Fast forward a few years, um, we can add a little bit more science to that. So a study that was published uh, earlier this year um, based on uh, some work that was done in Chicago. This is, uh, I, th I think, a, a sort of a wonderful, um, a wonderful call out to, uh, to Dave Willard and his colleagues at the Field Museum who were every day for 40 years before dawn walking a, a one and a half kilometer you know, perimeter around this building in Chicago, collecting the collision victims that, um, that this, building, um, this, th this building took. And those are specimens that are in the Field Museum now. There is an enormous number of birds in that on the order, I think, of probably uh, I can't remember the total number. It's in the many tens of thousands, probably 40 to 60,000 specimens um, over that time period. And it allowed for some really spectacular opportunities when we realized for the last 20 years of that sampling that Dave and his colleagues and the Chicago bird uh, collision monitors were doing, um, for part of that time, we have good radar sampling. And also, it so happens that the people that were monitoring had the very good fortune and the good um, understanding 
to think about, well, how much light is actually coming from this building? Let me count the number of illuminated windows, the illuminated window bays at McCormick Place Convention Center and, and make note of that at the same time we're collecting specimens. And now obviously that we have radar data too. And one of the things we can do with that is look at the effects of something very different from what we saw at the Tribute in Light. What about indoor lighting? So these, these bays of windows that you could envision at a convention center um, that are illuminated at night and attract birds. So just to frame here, we're talking over this approximately 40 year period from uh, the early 1980s uh, to 2020. Um, there is a period of time where those window bays were illuminated all the time. And then really after 1998, McCormick Place stopped illuminating all of those. So there is a nice break point in thinking about um, what happened over the course of, of those years and over the course of that transition from the full lighting to the variable lighting period. And one of the things we see is that um, the, the number of collisions in spring and fall in that fully lighted period, the, the, um, the spring collisions, 855 um, on average, uh, the fall collisions, uh, 706. When we look at the difference between the full lighting period and the variable lighting period, we see this tremendous decline once that amount of light goes down. So the numbers decrease dramatically from 1999 forward. And one of the things that we can pretty easily see is that the number of collisions that we see when the window lights are on is much, much higher than it is when the lights are off. And we can take that and actually turn it into kind of a graphic that says, well, what if we just did nothing? Um, the, the difference in fatalities, you know, that, if, that the building was approximately 75% lit. Um, okay, we know that that kills a certain number of birds every year. But if we were to decrease that based again on all this information we have for when birds collided, how many, um, what was happening with radar, what was happening with weather, how many lights were on in the building, if we had half those windows lit, we would decrease the collisions by about 50%. And what if we actually ended up turning on all the lights? We'd increase the number of collisions by about 75%. So one of the things that was very clear, again, on the other side of the spectrum from thinking about what we learned at the Tribute and Light and Outdoor Light and how eliminating that can alter uh, for the positive birds uh, behaviors at night, taking these individual window bays and thinking about turning out lights, darkening individual windows also saves birds. We can bring it down to that scale. So between having the two of those kinds of sources of information and then thinking broadly about where is light distributed around the United States, where are the places where we might have impact? We did a study uh, that, that came out in 2019 um, looking at the 125 most populous cities in the United States and their risk of exposing birds to light pollution. Basically, it was a means of overlaying where is the light pollution, where is the intense bird migration, and where are the exposure risk areas. And looking at the differences between seasons, in this case, thinking about exposure risk in the Western US that is actually higher in the spring, and exposure in the Eastern US that's higher in the fall, we start to narrow down on where we might apply some of that logic of the exterior and interior light reduction or elimination. And just to bring it home a little bit closer, you may ask, well, where does Los Angeles fit? It, obviously it's one of the 125 most populous cities in the US. Uh, so in the spring, it sits at number four below Chicago, Houston, and Dallas in terms of, again, this is not how dangerous the city is. This is um, the risk of exposing birds to light pollution at night. So it's thinking about where are birds gonna to get to uh, get exposed to that particular hazard? And on the left side of the image, um, you see a number of other cities there. You see a spring and a fall. You'll notice LA is only on the spring side, right? Um, and there are a few reasons for that that we'll maybe get into a little bit later about the passage of migrants through uh, LA, LA County, California, et cetera, um, in the spring relative to what happens in the fall. And then also in particular, what happens in the fall in the Eastern US. Um, in the cities where Chicago, Houston, and Dallas, where there's massive migration 
migration traffic actually in both seasons. And, and uh, let me call your attention quickly to the, to the right-hand image here, because there's a lot happening there. Um, the idea is that uh, that area where we see the green in the bottom uh, sort of right-hand quadrant of the square versus the purple, uh, that's fall in green versus spring. So where you see that dividing line in the middle, that's pretty much cities that have the same kind of exposure risk in spring and fall. Anything above that line has greater exposure risk in the spring. Anything below that line has greater exposure risk in the fall. And you see Los Angeles illuminated there with a very large bubble, meaning that relative to the others, that bubble is scaled to migration intensity size. It's way up there, right? And But you see it during the spring, and it's not something that happens during the fall um, in, in anywhere near what some of these other cities have. So this idea, again, let's follow the thread all the way from the notion of being able to quantify migration and then predict migration based on the radar ornithology and the methods we can use there. And then turning that information into uh, potential conservation actions by studying the relationships between bird migration and light pollution at uh, a scale um, uh, where intense light is happening outside uh, on a particular night every year where uh, light is happening on an interior basis and causing birds to collide. And then thinking broadly across cities, where is this light pollution likely to overlap with bird migration? And with all of that said, we can turn that into an action system. So one of the things that we visualize and that we've started to pilot over the last couple of years are these lights out alerts. Maybe some of you are familiar with them. They're, they're just operational this year, but obviously we're very early in migration. So these are some examples from, from previous years, uh, in fact, last year. And, and what you can see here is, is basically that we're using the bird migration forecast model and on nights when there is high intensity based on that particular location and a sample of over you know, 20 years of data, um, uh, is this above a particular threshold uh, for the area? When it is, lights out alert, an opportunity to, on a very much ad hoc basis, turn out lights, you know there's going to be intense migration, let's broadcast this information uh, as widely as we can. Um, yes, we, we know if we draw the thread from what I've just told you, less light is absolutely better for bird migration and every place we can get rid of it at night, that's great. Um, but if we don't necessarily have the capability to just in broad, uh, sort of broad strokes eliminate it, if we have homeowners or buildings or energy industry where we might, for whatever reason, um, have only the opportunity to encourage them to do this at a particular place in time, we now have the opportunity to highlight where some of those places and times are. Again, broad message, much less light, much better for nocturnal migration, but here's an opportunity where we can turn some of that conservation action at both scales um, into, well, let's do something simple to protect migrating birds, reduce the light pollution. So now that I've talked about um, the, the science a little bit and um, where we're, we're going with the conservation action, let me bring it home to some of the birding and science and local and kind of uh, interesting perspectives that, that might be relevant to LA County. Cause I know that was one of the things that, that uh, we really wanted to talk about tonight. And also I'll, I'll give you a little sneak preview of something that's coming uh, in probably about two weeks or three weeks. Let's start with that. No, why wait? Um, so for those of you that have been on the BirdCast uh, website before, um, over the last few years, I've mentioned, you've seen the, the bird migration forecast maps. Uh, you've seen the live maps. Now, for the first time uh, in a couple of weeks, you're going to see this bird migration dashboard. And it's very different from the maps. Those maps obviously tell you quite a bit about what the broad patterns look like 
Um, but you could only really sort of look at them from the perspective of, of regions or continental movements. Yes, you could understand where and, and when and how intense migration would be, but you didn't have the opportunity really to, to drill down into it and understand, well, what's the timing of, of migration uh, in a particular location? Um, what altitude are birds moving? What speed and direction? And, and how does that relate to what's happened over the course of uh, the season and, and the cumulative number that's going to uh, occur in that location. We're gonna be able to do all those things with this BirdCast dashboard. So these are real data from LA County, um, but the, obviously it's historical and this is just something we've used to, to test what we're, what we're building here. Um, and, and you'll also, I'll call your attention, you also notice that there's community science data here. There's eBird information about the expected migrants that, um, uh, really, this is generated from uh, only the frequency information from eBird, so changes from week to week. So um, it's still a work in progress, but it's our first real attempt, and I think first real coherent attempt, to do a few really cool things that we've wanted to do for a long time um, that, that allow us to kind of zoom down to the county level and talk about what birds are doing in this particular location, look at it from a number of different perspectives, allow you to explore these data and to understand what's happening as it's happening live every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but also look back in time and explore patterns that we haven't even explored yet. So there's gonna be all kinds of cool stuff that I think comes out of this kind of a, a visual tool that's that's being developed. Um, and, and we don't necessarily know all the things that will come out. Now, this was a work in progress. Uh, th this snapshot was a few weeks old. Uh, a few different things have occurred since then. We've changed a few things. You'll be able to see it live in a couple of weeks. It's gonna be at dashboard.birdcast.info uh, and it'll obviously be right up on the website so going to be very very cool and i want to call to your attention um, one thing that that i certainly have in mind uh, knowing a little bit about Bear Divide, sadly not from uh, personal experience of going to see morning flight there, but talking with Ryan Terrell and others about it, I see some really cool opportunities to immediately start thinking about, well, what's happening at Bear Divide in the migration monitoring there, for example, and what are we seeing the night before in terms of what the dashboard is showing? This is May 4, um, uh, 2021, and this is uh, on the, the dashboard that um, we're showing right now. And on the far left of the image, uh, the information from uh, Bear Divide on that same night. So obviously there are gonna be places where that information comes together, where there are divergences, uh, comparisons to be made, sort of understandings that can be gleaned. Very excited to see the ways that this expands. I think there's a, a lot of really cool opportunity there, in particular in LA County, and in particular for connecting what happens at night with what happens during the day, because I think that there's an enormous amount of information that we still don't understand about what's going on with these continued migrations. Morning flight in the Eastern US is something that it, to the best of our knowledge is a whole lot more limited than it is in many areas in the West. And I think there are a number of reasons that that, that might be, but it's wide open for study, I think. So a, a potential avenue to start exploring it here. Oh boy, other local patterns to think about and explore. Um, apologies for sort of the blocky kind of childlike graphic. I just had this idea earlier today and kind of threw it together quickly. Um, there's a lot of information here, but but I wanted to highlight for you, and I probably don't need to since you all go birding in the area constantly, how much local variation there is across the West, how much there is in California, how much there is probably even just in LA County, whether you're at coast or mountains or in, you know, east or west of, of, uh, of mountains um, or in between. Um, in terms of uh, the altitude of migration, its timing over the course of the night, the intensity, these images that you see here are called uh, vertical profiles, these, these snapshots, these postage stamps, um, and, and the white bars kind of basically uh, point to what from what radar station those vertical profiles originated. So this was the night um, of 21 uh, to 22 April 2020. This was uh, preceded that enormous movement of birds at Bear Divide. And one of the things I want to call your attention to in these posted stamps is that 
um, the places where you see those really dark blues and the purples in them, it's not critical that you see all the detail, the numbers, but just where those patterns are and how variable those are across not only Southern California, but also the Western US all the way up to Washington. Though, where those blues and purples are, that's where the densest areas of birds are. And those graphics are showing you on the y-axis, the altitude above the ground, and on the x-axis, the time of the night. So think about those and the bullseye of where the intense migration is when you're on the coast in Southern California. There's a distribution of intense migration on this night in particular that is all through that altitudinal column and really across the night. Yeah, there's variation, but uh, it's an intense movement. You move just a little farther up the coast, a very different pattern. You move inland to the east, again, a very different kind of pattern. But all of these things are obviously connected in some ways because in some parts of the ranges, in particular the Yuma to Southern California connection, this far southwestern Arizona to Southern California connection, birds are going to be moving within a night among those places, among sites there. So I think there's a really cool opportunity to start thinking about this kind of local variation and what it might mean looking at these altitudinal patterns, looking at the timing and intensity and how it varies and thinking about how, how birds are moving through the West because something really interesting is happening there. And of course, related to what's happening from that radar image, we did do some studies that look at, well, how does, how does migration and how do flight behavior relate to, relate to wind directions? It's so much more complex in that part, in your part of the world than it is, for example, where I am in New York right now. There's a much general, uh, much more general pattern of, of birds that are, when they get drifted to the coast, uh, for example, in fall migration in New York with strong westerly winds, morning flight then has birds reorienting back to the west, basically returning farther inland, et cetera. Birds dealing with drifting or, um, uh, or, or compensating for the wind, it's something that's fairly simple to understand. Do you move with it and then go to do some morning flight in the following day to compensate? Or do you compensate during the night and sort of change your direction um, uh, so that you're moving in a continuous direction, but you're not getting drifted? And it's a choice that birds can make, right? So in Southern California in particular, we see all kinds of potentially um, diverse choices that birds can make. You know that the wind directions are all over the place, but obviously birds are going in a particular way. They're trying to get to a particular donation, uh, destination. And the thinking about their preferred directions and how they're behaving in these winds is a really complicated situation. And of course, not only does it is that the, the manifestation of, of what we saw in the radar images before and the vertical profiles and where and how birds are moving, what altitudes, what times of night relative to winds, but it also translates into the migration models on the right hand side of this image, those dots are um, basically the uh, behavior of the birdcast forecast model at different radar stations. I narrowed it into those in the West because I just wanna highlight for you that when we look at the Eastern US, we're up in the blue range. That's like, you know, I was talking about 80% of the variation in migration intensity explained by weather variables. When you go to the West, that number changes a lot. Yeah, there are still some places where the model does well, but there are also some places where the model does abysmally bad, so bad that, that it actually, um, not only does it not follow the data trend, it's actually worse than like putting a straight line through your data um, that with, with no relationship at all. So um, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of detail we can get that, um, that we haven't really, uh, we haven't explored. And I think these from the dashboard to the vertical profiles on radar, to thinking about flight behaviors and wind and how migration and weather uh, relate and how we can think about predicting, there's a lot to be done there. I also want to touch quickly on uh, the notion of raptor migration. So I heard at the beginning of this talk, and I know from playing around eBird and spending a little time in that part of the world in March and April about Swainson Hawks, Swainson Hawks, um, Swainson's Hawk movements in your area. So I just want to highlight this notion of thinking about radar as a means to uh, to study that. This uh, paper that uh, would 
buried in gray literature uh, more than 20 years ago was an approach that that uh, I was fortunate to, to do with Sid Gotro when I was at Clemson in terms of thinking about extracting where hawk migration was happening and relating that to, um, to intense, uh, to hawk counts and large numbers of raptors and really identifying in the landscape and or the airspace where raptors are. Um, that just by at this time, when we published this 20 years ago, filtering the data um, in particular, looking for areas where really, really dense uh, reflectance was happening in the radar when we knew there wasn't rain and being able to assign that to, oh yeah, these are streams of raptors. These are streams of broadwing hawks, Wainson's hawks, turkey vultures, for example, in those um, left-hand images in South Texas, in Brownsville. You'll see in the top two images, in the blues and the reds, the unfiltered version on the left-hand side, the reflectivity on the right-hand side, the the velocity of what's up there. You'll notice that there are some areas where there are intense, more intense colors. When you filter out uh, to leave only those intense colors in the bottom two panels on the left, you'll see that these areas, they actually corresponded to large numbers of raptors moving, streams of raptors moving. We could also do it in places where the numbers were much smaller. For example, on the right side, Greenville, South Carolina, I would stand on the top of the biology building and count broad-winged hawks. Sid would be gathering the radar information. We do the same process of taking the radar data, looking at the reflectivity and the velocity, and then filtering out and leaving only those most intense echoes, no Knowing there's no rain and being able to relate that to the quantities of raptors that were moving. So there's potential to do something very similar in Southern California. I don't have any data to show it right now, but guaranteed there are some of those radars that will sample some of the areas where, you know, hundreds of Swainson's hawks are on the move, or maybe 3,000. I know there's a big day with, with 3,000 a few years ago that maybe, maybe that kind of information is something you'll be able to extract. And so let me end um, with some thinking about where we're going in the future. So I've talked about this perspective um, from really thinking about using radar to monitor uh, bird migration and that that's been the front facing view that, that you all have seen from BirdCast for the last five, 10, 20 years. But there are other things that we can talk about beyond birds and beyond radar. So one of those, I mentioned uh, the notion of, of acoustics when we were talking about the tribute and light. And one of the things that we've been working on at the lab is um, trying to automate the process of uh, recording audio data, extracting the valuable information, in this case about flight calls, birds migrating at night, and then try to produce um, species lists, call counts um, the, that, that we can review the morning after uh, or as it's happening, instead of having to try to process it all ourselves, try to listen to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of hours of information that we may have recorded over time to process what's happening at night and to put a face on what's happening at night. You'll notice up to now that I have not talked about really any species when it comes to talking about radar data. Radar data are species agnostic. They tell you how many birds are up there, the bird biomass. We understand that biomass uh, and, and kind of put numbers on it based on what the expected migrants might be, but we don't know what they are from the radar data. We know what they are by recognizing what's calling up there at night as it's happening. And then obviously the eBird data that tell us, well, we know birds are on the ground and we know they're moving. So some of this has to be contributing to what we see at night. But this notion of what's happening uh, from the flight call perspective, that we could put names on these flight calls. And if we could do that in an automated way, there'd be a real amazing potential for thinking about how to, how to put uh, not only these biological quantities from the, the biomass flows from radar, but also what the species component is as it's happening in real time. We're looking back to understand in places where we have audio data, what was going on five, 10 years ago. 
just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. So um, the current models that we're doing where we think about some of you hopefully have had the opportunity to use uh, Merlin, um, which uh, began, of course, as a as a computer vision project that was uh, going to be a means of identifying birds. You snap a, a, a shot with your camera. Um, you maybe write a description. You follow a couple, answer a few questions. Merlin tells you what the bird is. It now can do the same thing with audio, with bird song. It's evolving since uh, last over the last six months. There's going to be a new release soon. Um, and we're starting to look at that from the perspective of flight calls as well and building models for example, for great cheek thrush and oven bird, where we look at what a human count is and a human count means uh, in particular that I've gone through say an audio recording, uh, highlighted all the areas where great cheek thrushes have occurred in, you know, maybe hundreds of hours of recordings, listened to it, looked at the spectrograms to pick out where those calls are and then build a model to recognize calls and see how that does. And generally, what we want to see with these kinds of comparisons are that the human count at the model count falls somewhere along that straight line. And for these approaches in Merlin, we're really starting to get there. It's not perfect, but it's going to be there very soon, we think. So it's a great opportunity to think about moving forward and thinking about, oh, here's an opportunity where we can take the migration on radar. And what if we can do the same kind of acoustic information, like estimate numbers or estimate at least call counts to think about migration activity, migration activity estimated by acoustics, and see that from this 2015 data set we analyzed, that there's tremendous, tremendous uh, congruence in these patterns of when peak migration occurs from a bird migration number perspective on radar, and then the call count intensity uh, from acoustics. And then also thinking even a little bit further about, well, what is the eBird information tell us relative to the acoustic information and seeing that these patterns of when peak migration of say warblers and thrushes and sparrows based on the eBird community science data, when people are observing data on the ground and reporting their information about what's happening during the day, we can start to look at, well, how does that relate to when we look at peak timing of these different uh, groups of passerines, how does that relate to the acoustic record and thinking about some really close relationships there and how we might evolve that going forward into a into a combined effort for data that complement one another, where the radar and the acoustic and the eBird data all come together. Also, beyond thinking about acoustics and other me uh, methods for um, uh, monitoring migration, we have other topics we can cover, birds and aircraft, bird and aircraft collisions in particular. We published a paper early this year, earlier this year, or uh, uh, last year, I should say, um, looking at the relationship in the greater New York City area between collisions um, where, where birds ingested uh, or uh, planes ingested birds into their engines uh, or hit windshields of planes and migration traffic, uh, migration traffic from the perspective of radar and how, how many birds are moving over a particular place at uh, a particular time. And there's a very close relationship there. So starting to understand that allows us to then think further about, well, how do we avoid these kinds of scenarios? Thankfully, this one on the left, you'll probably remember the, the miracle on the Hudson 13 years ago in January, this past January. Um, everybody survived this collision, but a plane colliding with Canada geese, in fact, actually probably um, Canada geese that were, were displaced from a freeze much farther north uh, that were on the move facultatively, but thinking about ways of uh, avoiding these kinds of scenarios, sure, for the, uh, the, the protection of birds, but especially for the protection of humans and the loss of life uh, that we want to avoid. We can also think beyond birds and think about, well, Radar also does tell us amazing things about other biological activity in the atmosphere. Um, insects, this uh, particular case, some of you may remember the clouds of, of grasshoppers that descended on Las Vegas a few years ago, um, and, and a study that, that highlighted uh, a quantitative uh, approach to thinking about something on the order of you know, 20 to 40 million grasshoppers descending at a particular time, being able to think about radar not just as a um, as a means of surveying birds, but also surveying other aerial fauna and insects in particular, uh, I think is potentially a very powerful way forward.
particular in areas like the desert southwest, one of the things that we've wanted to do that we haven't is during periods of super blooms, um, in particular in the desert uh, southwest, Death Valley, other areas, um, thinking about relating patterns that we can see on radar to patterns of where the inflorescence is happening and thinking about whether we can actually detect any changes in insect populations that are occurring clearly locally at those times. Um, thinking about those kinds of studies, we want to go in that direction too. And of course, um, you know, uh, how uh, uncool or cool is it to talk about zoonotic disease at this point? Um, we all have seen, you know, firsthand the issues with that in the last two years, two and a half years. Um, and uh, right now in the Eastern US in particular, we're starting to see it again with highly pathogenic avian influenza and the connection between bird flu and where birds are on the move. So thinking about applying these kinds of radar data, these forecast models, the information that we have that allow us to understand average peak migration dates, or even uh, think about how to, to, to project from now, three weeks forward, six weeks forward, 12 weeks forward, where is an American widgeon or where's a blue winged teal going to be? Um, and what might that mean as a transmission event of some kind of uh, uh, for, for bird flu in particular right now? That kind of relationship between migrating birds and zoonotic disease is something we think could be really interesting to explore uh, going forward. And, and we think that some of these data that I've talked to you about tonight and some of these approaches and, and both the remote sensing and the community science side have some real opportunities there. So uh, I've talked for a long time um, and, and I really appreciate your attention and the opportunity to, to tell this uh, long and winding road of a story. Um, there are a lot of players involved here. I just want to highlight a few of them in terms of the partners. Much of the work that you've seen here, um, many of the images you've seen here, uh, I've been involved, but it's been led by people like Benjamin Van Doren, Kyle Horton, uh, Dan Sheldon, Cecilia Nielsen, Adrian Doctor, and a number of other people that have passed through Cornell and now are at, for example, like Kyle at Colorado State, Dan Sheldon is at UMass Amherst. Those are kind of the core partners. There's really a core scientific group, but, but even that doesn't capture the entirety of the, the people that are involved in the partnerships. The funding is diverse, uh, National Science Foundation, a number of uh, private foundations, in particular in Texas, uh, Lida Hill Philanthropies and Eamon G. Carter Foundation have supported a lot of the lights out that work, work that we're doing there and that we've been doing for the past two years. There's a lot of other partnership as well, including Microsoft, NASA. Um, it, it spans uh, the oceans, the Belmont Forum, Biodiversa um, and, uh, and, and the European Commission, um, other funding sources with partners in Europe, places that also have radar uh, networks and other data sets, and obviously tremendous competence and, and expertise in understanding bird migration and uh, radar. And then some of the lights out partners in specific, you'll see uh, specifically, you'll see a number of Texas organizations that are referenced there, but there are many, many more than this. Birdcast is a, is a tremendous family of partnerships and collaborations, and it would be uh, it would be tremendously rude of me not to highlight at least some of them here. And with that, I will leave you where we began with my favorite image uh, of this Charlie Harper illustration and the mystery of the missing migrants. And hopefully, um, I know it's very late where I am right now. You guys are probably just getting into your prime in the LA party scene. <laughs> um, but uh, I hope there's some time for some questions and some maybe some discussion. I'm happy to field it now, happy to field it by email, anything you like. And But thank you all for, for your attention and your audience here. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. We really, really enjoyed it. As, uh, so much information came at us. Um, yeah, thank yes, you very thank much. You so much. It's really a tour de force talk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. And if we, you, we already do have some questions, but if you, if, if anybody who has questions, please put them in the Q&A. Yes. Um, and we have some in the in the chat also, but I guess I, I want to start with with one you you mentioned um, that the uh, amount of light exposure to birds in Los Angeles was very large in spring, but not in fall. Why is that? 
it's a migration issue. Obviously, the light pollution piece stays the same or basically the same. But we've seen this in a lot of uh, parts of the continental US that there's a broad, broad pattern. It, it really sort of the eastern US dominates this of birds sort of moving up uh, in a more westerly um, distribution in the spring and a more easterly distribution in the fall, the social notion of loop migration. Obviously something different is happening in the West, whether it, it's clearly not that looped migration pattern that you see, say, for example, in the Great Plains, where in the spring there's a low level jet stream, like southerly flow of winds that are just transporting enormous numbers of birds. And then birds try to avoid that you know, headwind in the fall and move farther to the East. That that loop thing, yeah, you could possibly argue something like that is going on in the West. I don't think necessarily it is, but it certainly seems like the numbers are based on a radar perspective are really dramatically different in spring when it comes to LA and the California coast than they are in the fall. Now, whether that's there's some birds are obviously moving slightly offshore in the fall, whether it's that they're moving further inland, whether there's any other, whether there are just other patterns that are happening there. I leave that to you guys. I need to, you know, I, I, I want to understand a lot more about that. And that's like local, local knowledge of what exactly is going on that is not really that clear to me, other than the pattern is there, that it's a much stronger signal of birds based on a radar in this in the spring than it is in the fall and that's what different that's what creates that that imbalance between spring and fall for la hmm. okay great thanks um so let me grab some questions from the chat um because some of those have been there for a little while um and most of them many of them by lance um lance says uh, I, I guess this was early on, you uh, showed a, a map of the world with weather radar coverage and Lance's, there's no weather radar, uh, weather radar coverage in New Zealand. That seems surprising. Yeah, so some of the, there's more radar coverage than I showed, definitely. The availability of that information, the availability of the data from the, from the uh -huh. radar has been a challenge. And in fact, the, even the image that I showed, really, when you move, uh, let's have, what's a good politically sensitive way to frame it? <laughs> so when, when, you, when you think about the United States and the network that's there, um, that information collected by it now spans like 25 years. And it's, a, it's an archive that's posted um, and available on Amazon Web Services. You could go to it and access it freely if you have the capabilities to analyze it. Um, and again, I was talking about 140 plus radars in the contiguous US. In Europe, there are you know 140 to 200 radars that are operating, um, different meteorological services geopolitically operating them in mm -hmm. different countries with different meteorological organizations with different you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So there, it's really challenging. The information is there, but federating it is like whoa. It's I mean it's 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 hard enough to. Um, you know, to, to think about extracting that information necessarily in some cases from one meteorological organization, much less, you know, 10, 15, 20 different national organizations. You go to China and unfortunately we can't collaborate with them for whatever various reasons, like some of it is on their end, some of it's on our end, some of it's on both ends, but there's an enormous weather surveillance radar network there that, my God, think about the potential to quantify what's happening mm -hmm. in the Asian flyway. You know, it's like this incredible opportunity. Australia has a wonderful weather surveillance radar network. Those data, in fact, are fairly easily available, but for whatever reason, up until I, I don't think it's the case yet, but New Zealand hasn't, they've got information, but it's not participating in mm -hmm. that system, despite a, quite a lot of unification in that area when it comes to meteorology and the communities. It's, it's some of it's inexplicable geopolitical nonsense. Some of it is probably just not enough interest from people to say, oh, I'd pay for that. 
like for example mm -hmm. radar scope is a is an app that you can you can download i i don't own it i have no <laughs> no investment i'm not <laughs> advising anything but it's a wonderful app that that allows you to purchase you know access basically to real time radar um and uh australian data there are there canadian data are there even though you can't access canadian data easily from any other place right now other than that um we're working on that and hopefully canada is going to be part of the birdcast you know sort of graphics but that's a long answer basically to just say there are some problems with data there are some problems with politics and there are definitely places where these radar systems like new zealand and india and obviously some places in russia that we don't have access to and probably won't ever again maybe <laughs> um <laughs> you know um where we just don't have the information access you know like guaranteed there are data mm -hmm. but we're not going to be able to get at it for a while yeah all right great thank you um lily asks is there going to be a bird migration alert for los angeles i'm not sure what if, if yeah 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 so good good question um so right now on the birdcast website you can um you can put in your your local area um and actually sign up for migration alerts so yes you can do that and mm -hmm. it's based on right now it's based only on the radar forecast side of things so again i mentioned to you guys that thinking about this 20 plus year archive of information where we can characterize radar data for a particular radar station and say, oh, here's the threshold where we can identify what's high intensity migration, what we would consider a migration alert. And when you sign up for that, when it reaches that threshold or exceeds that threshold, you get a notification that says, cool. hey, they're migrating in your area. And, hmm. we can, and we can tell you about that 24, 48, 72 hours in advance. The secret version of BirdCast can do it a little bit longer than that, but the public facing version, <laughs> 24, 48, 72 hours in advance. So yeah, you can sign up for alerts like that. And right now we're we're piloting, I mentioned that the, the migration alerts and the lights out alerts are really based on the same kind of framework. The lights out specific ones have been in Texas, but we also can do that in other parts of the, the country, anywhere where we can extract radar data and make forecasts. We can do these sorts of similar kinds of framings like, oh, there's going to be intense migration. Go out birding, turn your lights off, cover mm -hmm. up your chickens, whatever it's going to be. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, right? Um, that that we can provide that. But yeah, there are migration alerts, and you can you can look at them for for LA County in particular. Um, and as I mentioned, that dashboard is also going to be available soon, so you'll be able to explore the as much data as we can feed into it. Eventually, it's going to be everything, all the years we have. Probably the first go round of it will probably be 2018 up to present, um, and obviously what's happening live. But but different ways to think about migration, um, the alert, or just kind of exploring what's happened. Uh, but you'll be able to do both of those things. Oh, no, that's great. Um... Alex asks, is there a plan to get the lights out information out to the non-birding public? There is, uh, we're working on it. Um, we, it, not only to the non-birding public, but we're starting to work with industry. We've started to get an increasing call from, uh, from industry in terms of both thinking about light intensity, light color, uh, the extent of light, when should it be turned off, uh, ideally, um, so yeah, there's been a, there's been a big media push in Texas. That's the place where we've been exploring because, because Houston and, and Dallas were so high on that exposure ranking list. And because the magnitude of migration there is so enormous, like a billion, a billion birds every, you know, spring, um, we focus there and there's been a pretty concerted effort trying a few different ways with these lights out alerts with talking to building owners and managers, with getting mayors and, and uh, municipalities to sign proclamations that say these are lights out nights, um, getting celebrities, actually the former first lady, you know, Laura Bush happens to be quite a birder and really interested in the natural world and made a number of public service announcements for us that just shot the 
the Facebook ratings and everything through the roof for Lights Out Texas. So that kind of combination of grassroots approach mm -hmm. and celebrity profile, you know, has really worked for us to get the message to a really, um, not the choir, you know, uh, but to a very different group of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we are trying to push that. And we do think that that's really important, especially because obviously the message about Lights Out for, for protecting bird migration and thinking about that has all sorts of other resonance in terms of energy savings and just our impact on the planet, um, obviously human health issues too, in terms of light pollution. So there's lots of stuff that travels with that. It's just that we've happened on, obviously from our from expertise on the bird migration piece, but it started to become a much different kind of uh, a beast, if you will, with a lot of different parties getting involved, international dark sky, various other groups that, that may be wanting light pollution minimized for other reasons or are all starting mm -hmm. to kind of synergize and spread beyond the burning public okay no, hey, i just I, I i saw a question i wanted to address that kit that kimball sure. mentioned about uh the you know odd to see black black gin sparrow is one of the expected migrants yeah there's <laughs> There are a few things that are broken in the in the expected migrants piece because right now it's based the this version um that you saw on that was based only on changes in frequency of occurrence from one week to the next so obviously when people are going out birding and biasing their birding in particular ways we're capturing more than just migrants in this original snapshot since then we've done some tweaking and I think removed some some cases like that. I wanted to originally with that expected migrants piece, just use a simple rules based approach and see what would happen if we said, okay, show me only the birds that uh, are occurring with this frequency of occurrence and um, that don't occur for, you know, um, more than uh, uh, 12 weeks out of the year to obviously eliminate the residents and things like that and are don't have super low frequencies of occurrence that is you know like uh the the ruddy ground of pattern well yeah it's a migrant you know but it's not exactly the migrant that we want to capture here because radar is not capturing it so much and the rules-based approach was cool but it thinking like well it'd be fun to imply that apply that in places where we don't have radar and just have eBird data and look at expected migrants, but it didn't quite work in all the ways we wanted. So we ended up having to implement sort of a, a, a filter on that expected list of, okay, here are the nocturnal migrants and here are the movements. So things like black chin sparrow in those cases where it's a really odd, odd occurrence for a variety of reasons to appear on a list of expected migrants um, at that time and in that place, et cetera. And just be <laughs> because you wouldn't expect it to be uh, say in the top 15 uh, movers uh, from an absolute value perspective of like the greatest change in frequency from one week to the next, solely based on migration. Yeah, there were some errors there. And I think we've worked them out. I have a very strong feeling that because you're going to be intently looking at this, that there are going to be more errors. And I hope that you catalog them for us because I, I would do want to make this as smart as possible. And, and in the future, really think about it being kind of like the data drive themselves and not just like oh okay i have a migration species list that i'm going to enforce on this like i want the i want the information to drive it not some kind of more subjective approach but but we are where we are with the first pass and the the value of being able to assign you know hopefully better than that original pass with the black chin sparrow and some other crazy stuff that showed up in the data <laughs> um that i won't i won't embarrass myself with um that uh, the power of having that inspected migrant piece in there to highlight here's a face on all that biomass that radar can detect, we think is going to be really important. Obviously, we want it to be as right as we can make it, you know, and as solid as we can make it. But it's going to be a work in progress. I, I know there are going to be some errors. <laughs> Thank you for calling it out, Kimball. I appreciate it. I knew you would. I figured this <laughs> out. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 um let's see what we have um going back to the oh we have too many questions here which is a good thing um okay, more questions are better i'm happy to if, if we don't have time for all of them i'm happy to field them by email you know anytime i can actually put my email into the you know uh into the uh 
to the chat just so but yeah keep right. keep going okay uh, let's see so um on the q a someone asked this is going back to the um to the the the, the lights out um it seems illogical to have resistance to turn off non-essential lights. How did the time on time off for McCormick Place come about? Was it political? I get the impression it's done on a building by building basis, makes lights out effort seem very hopeless. We can't get people to put on masks that save people. How hard will it be to get people to turn out lights that save birds? Yeah, good, good points. Good question and good question. So when it comes to McCormick Place, um, yeah, that that was that definitely represented a building like a building specific decision, and some of that involved shame. Yeah, no question. Lots of dead things showing up beneath your building. Probably a good idea to turn off your lights. Some of it was simply a change in human behavior in terms of the activities in the convention center that had nothing to do necessarily with any attempts at advocacy and forcing this to happen you know there was a vagary of human behavior that sort of allowed for this pattern to to change that is certainly one scenario the scenario where um how do you have it not be a building to building scenario how do you have it be a broader kind of citywide adopted or region wide or that kind of a situation i think there are a couple ways toward that so what we tried in texas uh, because legislation is not always the best path to success in Texas, apparently, um, to getting to, to try to pass legislation, getting to the mayors of the cities, getting to people that were interested advocacy groups, and getting to the building owners and managers that are managing, say, tens or hundreds of buildings in a particular city that have control over a particular behavior of their entire domain of buildings, that was enormously successful. Um, and that approach of going to the business and the political side and saying, look, here's the science behind this. There are lots of reasons this is a good idea. This is a political win. You know, you should do this. You need a win right now. Um, that, that's been a very successful path. And then I also want to highlight that, that there is a legislative path to this too. And it happened in New York this past year. So in December, um, New York City passed two, uh, the city council passed two laws that actually regulate light pollution um, because of protecting nocturnally migrating birds. So between 11 uh, p.m. and 6 a.m., there is now a law on the New York, two laws on the New York City books for first New York City owned and leased buildings that's about reducing that exterior light. And, and every place where it's you know, non-essential, so to speak, um, and um, it's, it, or every place where I, I, I should say it's you know, that the, the city can do this, um, that, that's now officially law. Now the enforcement, we'll see how that goes, but the fact that that, that, um, that opportunity in New York and in places like Chicago, where that's also on the docket right now, uh, I guess San Francisco has has worked on this before and a few other places. There are paths there that get toward a much broader adoption. You know, that I, I think the message here is that um, I agree with you. It's really challenging to get people to do seemingly really, really simple, non-controversial things. But there are places where we're pushing on that and providing, you know, information that, you um, as best as we can, as simply as we can, about even just turning off your lights in your building, like one building window, that that can make a difference. It seems like it's getting traction. I guess it's a little simpler than put on a mask and you won't get sick. You know, I'm not sure. It seems like it, it could be. People have certainly kind of come to us and said, oh, like I, I didn't know birds migrated at night and that they were attracted to and disoriented by light, I, I'll, I'll turn my lights off. Like I, what, you know, it, and it's going to save me some, you know, some dollars. So yeah, I'll do that. And it's going to make me sleep better. You know, these are, we're trying to figure out some of these messages. And I should mention there's a, there's a cool project that's happening now that speaks exactly to this question that you're asking of like, of, of the place where the sociology comes into 
uh, the human behavior and the science of trying to do conservation and ecological forecasting to, to create that conservation. It's called Growing Convergence. And there's a project that Kyle Horton and Jeff Kelly, who's at, uh, Kyle's at Colorado State, I mentioned, Jeff Kelly's at Oklahoma, uh, University of Oklahoma. And they have this Growing Convergence, uh, Growing Convergence NSF uh, award right now to look at exactly these kinds of questions. What are the effective ways to, to message um, what kinds of protocols, what kinds of campaigns, um, how do you get people to buy in, you know, how much do people know or care, what is the smallest amount that you uh, are required to sort of give them to actually get it to move the needle. Wow, great. Um, no, I hope these, these things have become, you know, continue to be uh, more successful and gain traction. Yeah, I hope um, so too. Let's see. There's another question by uh, uh, anonymous person on the uh, Q and A. Do birds fly into dark buildings or cell phone towers? That's a really good question. They definitely there. There is collision there. No question that they that they do fly into things like that. Um, whether it is a function of attraction to an illuminated structure or not, and then an incidental crash into darkness, or whether it's simply dark. I can't say from from uh, any any scientific data I have how often one or the other happens, but we do know that there are certain instances where certainly birds do collide with these other things that are not illuminated. So any sort of structure that's there, yeah, that's definitely going to be that's definitely going to be an issue. But it certainly seems like when in the work that we've done and the work that our colleagues have done that when you have an illuminated structure and then you take the light away from it, that you don't get collision when that light goes away. So something in particular is happening in that, in that illuminated zone that certainly relates to uh, attraction, which is very much a fundamental ancestral feature of all sorts of organisms you know, that go far, far back down into our evolutionary history, that presumably like phototaxis and, and you know, the chemistry of, of, of food and energy, I'm sure that propagates far up the evolutionary tree. Um, and then also that the disorientation piece, like light, you know, the, the, this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but, but, the, but light certainly disorients for a very particular set of reasons for birds that are migrating at night, for the cue systems, the sensory perceptions uh, and the sensory ecology that they have. Uh, that portion, portion of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum of visible light does some really wacky things to what we think of the, the molecules in the eye that allow birds to, to sense the magnetic field, among other things. Um, other electromagnetic radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation can do that too. But that visible light piece, you know, relative to light and buildings, um, and light around buildings that are dark, it looks like the light piece really dominates relative to birds just colliding with things that they happen to to run into. It seems that they are far far better at various kinds of perceptions um, and avoiding hitting things that are those sorts of structures when light is not involved. Mm -hmm. So I think we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. We still have a bunch of questions on the, on the <laughs> chat, although a lot of these are, um, are technical. Um, and I don't know how long you want to be up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably should go to sleep sometime soon, but I'll tell you, I, I, I would like to make sure that we answer that we answer all the questions. So um, I know you can save the chat. Um, I did put my my email address in there uh, as well. So I want to make sure that that all the questions get answered because to me it's um, I'm very happy when lots of questions come up. It means uh, it, it certainly is a good feeling that people are listening and wondering what's they're like. Well, why is that that way? Or yeah, uh, yeah something sure. confusing or whatever. So you know, um, we can definitely take a couple more. But then you know, save the let's save the chat and then and then people can I can reach out or people can reach out to me whatever okay. you want. Well, Maybe actually. We Go Actually, ahead, we can. Yeah, I was going to say we can post the your answers onto our website underneath 
uh, you know, right in with this webinar uh, rebroadcast. So Absolutely. it'll be there. No problem. No problem. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, any any uh, any one nugget that looks particularly appealing, happy to go down a rabbit hole, or happy to try to <laughs> try to say something concise, whichever whichever you like. Um, may, I, uh, may I pick out the one that I would really most like to hear? Sure, go for it, Lance. Lance. Lance, thank you. So, to give you a little bit of background, Andrew. I'm I'm a radar astronomer. I specialize in range Doppler radar imaging of asteroids all at right. NASA. So I'm a bit of a ringer in all of this. <laughs> um, maybe more than a bit. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll send you an email. But um, but I, I guess the question that I'm most interested in: what are the specific things observable in the next rad radars? that allow you to distinguish birds from bugs from rain from from other things are you looking at things like polarization ratios or radar reflectivities or you know velocity patterns yeah. elevation patterns you know what is it you're actually using yeah so we definitely look at all those things radar reflectivities are the primary that's that's often the first the first pass um that that based on a, a few different series of studies over the last uh, 50 or 60 years um, about what various types of hydrometeors, you know, various precipitation types, rain and grapple and hail and snow look like and what that registers from ground truthing relative to um, relating the moon watching data to patterns on radar that radar reflectivity piece has been critical. But that said, um, before the polarization uh, event happened and the polarimetric radar uh, really became a thing in 2013. Um, we did think about using velocity. So in particular, um, uh, places where like the biology, like, okay, birds versus insects. Sure. seems like insects ought to just be drifting around with the wind mostly and birds are powered flyers. So anytime you see, you know, birds uh, in, in excess of five meters per second above wind speed or moving in some direction that's not with the wind. You know, old logic 20, 25 years ago said, oh, those are birds and, and anything drifting with the wind is insects. Turns out as we started to learn more and more about insects, there are some really fast flying insects that are pretty big. And even though for, um, for the WSR-88D, which is a 10 centimeter radar, even though the bird signal dominates um, when it comes to just the, the amount of, um, uh, of signal returned from, from the water that's in a bird relative to what's in the body of an insect and its orientation, there's still an issue there when it comes to enormous numbers of insects uh, moving at high speeds, um, even, even in really weird directions relative to the wind. Like you think about Anax Junius, like Green Darner, you know, those things can move in in large numbers um, or or a wandering glider. Um, those things can can move fast. They can move in large numbers. They can occur in really odd spots in the air column. So so there are some real challenges when it comes to big insects and birds that we're so far we've seen that because of the sensitivity of the 10 centimeter radar to other different wavelengths, it looks like we're doing a good job at capturing bird dominated signals when we think and insects when we're not. Um, we also use time of season to sort of investigate this a little bit, thinking about, especially in Texas, uh, we know that there's that period, April, where really intense bird movement happens and say June, July, August, where really intense insect and actually bat movements happen too, and start to look at the patterns there. But it's reflectivity driven, but then we do use some of those other moments as well. And increasingly, we have started to think about the polarimetric moments. So a paper that you might be interested in that I can share, and it, it is, it's definitely very technical, relates to the computer science side of, of how how we're thinking about training these models and some of it, the, the computer vision piece and looking at uh, also numerical data from uh, the polarimetric information like correlation coefficient where there are real cutoffs between what's precipitation and what's biology based on various meteorological studies, applying that kind of thing too. So there are a number of different ways we've tried to attack this. None of them are perfect, definitely not. I think at this point, what 
what we and what I try to say is, you know, I often reference biological activity that's dominated by birds. And then we build up those bird numbers based on, you know, some radar cross section that we might assume of the species that are there um, from studies that were done by like Eric Eastwood or others in the 60s and few going forward. But there are a lot of pieces of the pie here. Um, and they don't all fit together perfectly. You can see the pie sheet, you can see some places where you, you know, you like you didn't, didn't quite beat in the flower enough and that kind of thing. But I think we're getting there with every iteration of, of some of these new models of thinking about how to incorporate these different kinds of radar moments, all based on that initial reflectivity and relational studies with reflectivity of ground truthing with rain, ground truthing with birds uh, and, and moon watching, and then try to build from there. That's where it started. And, and that is still a core way that we think about things. Great. Well, um, we are receiving tons and tons of thank yous in the chat and all that. And uh, I think I'll add my voice and say thank you very much. Yes, this was a... too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. And I love all these questions. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I probably could just stay up for a long time. But I, I think I'd be better suited to answer them like at a different time because the, the answers will start to get progressively. They've been long winded already. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, would you be willing to uh, entertain questions if people sent them to you by email? Oh, totally. Yeah, I put the email in the uh, in the chat. Um, you're welcome to post the email too. Feel free to to email anytime. I'm happy to to respond. We can post them, you know. And chances are, when you ask the question, somebody else also wants to know oh, the right. answer. So it may end up on the Birdcast site under the frequently asked questions. You know. Oh, great. If you can't get enough of it. Even so better. Feel, feel yep. free. Well, again, thank you very, very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, for everyone out there, we'll be wrapping up our Cornell month next week with Justin Stahl and, uh, on eBird. And uh, I think that'll do it. Thank you very much again. And we well, thank will- Thank you, Andy. Thank you all. I really appreciate the thank audience. You and much. thank you for the invitation. It's yeah. wonderful to, to see you all. Great to speak. Thank you. And we, again. we will see all of you next week. Take care, everyone. Yep. Goodbye. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Good night. Bye. -bye.